Chapter 4, Growth, Diversity, and Conflict, 1720-1763. So we're, we're further along in our development of these colonies in the, in the New World. Uh, 1720, by this time, mostly established. We talked about the British Atlantic trade and, and the, the very prosperous and profitable trade system, that triangular trade. This is, this is in full force here. Mercantilism is in full force. And the chapter goes through the end of the French and Indian War. 1763 is important because this is when France is defeated and forced to leave the, the uh, continent of the New World. And England becomes the last uh, country standing and in full control of, of the, at that, at that time, the eastern part of what would become the United States. Okay, So the population is growing rapidly and in the in the English colonies, and this is a bit of a problem. So this this is the growth part of the of the title of the chapter. Um, so the population is growing out of control like a weed, and it's mostly coming from white people coming from from Europe, but not necessarily the white Protestant people that were here. You're talking about Eastern Europeans coming with Catholicism and Judaism and different cultures and different languages, and they didn't mix very well. So you have conflicts, okay? Uh, same race, but different cultures, different languages, religions, customs, and it creates conflict. So this is not an ethnocentric white European thing here. This is white on white conflict, okay? Uh, the the idea and why they come is this, this thought of endless land. And it, it was somewhat true, but they came in such numbers that the English colonies here on the, I'm showing you with my cursor here, on the East Coast, and I've, I've mentioned this before, but they're, they're, they're somewhat hemmed in by this mountain chain, the Appalachian Mountains. They, they can't really spread out over here because this mountain chain's in the way. But the other side of that is over, even if they were over here, this is all, this is all French land right here. Okay, so you start to, so you have this conflict. English and the French, the conflict is growing, okay? And then the English released 200,000 acres of land in the interior in French lands on the west side of the Appalachian. So over here in what today is called Ohio, they released 200,000 acres. And they, and they call this the Ohio Company of Virginia. And they're telling English settlers to, to go there and, and settle there. Okay, So this makes the French pretty angry again. They get pretty worked up. So they, they begin to build a string of forts in the Ohio Valley to prepare to defend themselves from what they think will be an ultimate English invasion, okay? And we'll talk more about that uh, in this chapter. The point is, for right now, England realizes that their confrontation against the French needs to happen because the colonists need to spread out. Land's getting scarce. The sardine issue, we, we need to spread out and populate here, okay? We got to get rid of the French to, to do that. So, it becomes an inevitability that the English and the French would clash, okay? So the people that came, they're looking for opportunity. Back in Europe, they were tenants. You, you didn't own land. It was very difficult to own land. If you were a common person, the chances of you owning land was, was really never, okay? 75% of the land was owned by the nobility. We talked about who they were. Uh, much of much of the rest of the land was maybe unusable, so very little chance, very little land available. This is one of the push factors that push you out of Europe, and of course America's pulling you by land, so push-pull factors. And they came in huge numbers. Initially, they set up yeoman farming communities. So what is a yeoman farmer? You see that the image here turns from a farmer to a, a militia man, which was Kind of interesting. The first time I I uh, used this slide, I was I looked at the slide and saw the farmer. I looked away to talk to the class for a minute. And I came back and it was a, a militia man. I'm like, am, am I losing my mind? So I didn't realize that the that the image changed. But anyway, th this is what this person does. He's a farmer who will put down the pitchfork and pick up a musket if he needs to defend his his home or his his uh, community or the or maybe a, 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 a fort that he's around. So the yeoman farmer became the ideal American. This is what people wanted to be, an individual, independent, your own lamb, honest, virtuous, hardworking, independent man. Uh, yeoman farmers were central to the Republican vision of this new nation. 
Uh, so a yeoman farmer did not need large numbers of other laborers like slaves because they owned their own property. They would use family labor. So these people had lots of children to create more workers. And they would work their own property. They were self-sufficient. Okay, And they were seen as citizens that had political influence in this new republic. In the beginning, these were mostly mostly Puritans. Okay, And we've talked about the Puritans being patriarchal, male-dominated, very harsh, very stern, you know, very uh, God-fearing. And these are the people that work hard to prove to God that they're worthy to go to heaven. Uh, very, uh, you know, strict with natives, abusive to natives, and didn't like them and despise them and, and killed them, uh, wanted to get rid of them. They, they thought that God was punishing the natives with disease because they weren't his his chosen people, the Puritans were, okay? But very male-dominated. <clears throat> Puritan women did not have social equality. And this is out of your textbook also. Since he is thy husband, God has made him the head and set him above thee. This is what they believed, that, that men were superior to women. And a, a woman's duty was to love and revere her husband. You were subordinate in every facet of life to him. You were expected to have a large amount of children, five to seven or more. You had no equality in the church either. So if you were a woman and you were a Puritan, <clears throat> you were, you know, uh, pretty much under this kind of <clears throat> exploitative oppression. OK, we talked about how the, the captive women didn't want to go back to the Puritan ways because the native ways were, were more suitable for them. But the Puritans come, again, to, re to escape the restrictions of Europe uh, regarding their, land, their, their religion, <clears throat> okay, but also landlessness. <clears throat> because without land, you had very little. It lessened your chances of getting ahead, okay, according to, to them. Land ownership was a new thing for them. You didn't own land in, in Europe. So they want to create this self-sufficient farm for their family. <clears throat> and this is called competency. This is a term in your book. Uh, the ability of a family to keep a household solvent and independent and pass that ability on to their next generation. So you're gonna you're gonna pass this this down to your family and hopefully keep it keep it going, prosperous for generations. Okay. This was the ideal that you create this self-sufficient farm, okay? Another uh, another word in your in your list is freehold. So what's that? This is where a lands that are owned in their entirety. A person owns the land, and that's all there is to that. No feudal dues, no obligation to any landlord, no obligation to a lord above you. Uh, you have the legal right to improve, transfer, or sell the land. So it's a, it's a system similar to what we have today, uh, or at least the beginning of it. I would say few people, although some do, own their properties today outright. We carry mortgages and loans to pay on. <clears throat> secured by lien the property, typically cash, right? So I, I mentioned feudal. What, what do I mean by that? What does feudal mean? The, the feudal system was the system of political organization that prevailed in Europe from the 9th to about the 15th centuries, uh, having as its basis the relation of lords to vassals. So what the heck does that mean? <laughs> okay, so... Lords would grant land to vassals who would give their loyalty and protection to the Lord in return. Vassals were subject to the will of their Lord, and uh, they, could, they could grant lands to, to knights below them, creating a contract with them, and hopefully at some point become lords themselves. Okay, So looking at this pyramid, we talked about pyramids before, and this is, this is something you see all through history. The top is in, in charge. They have all the wealth, and the bottom uh, you know, uh, works hard to make the top wealthy. So, so this is the European system. So you, you see the king at the top here. And he's, he, of course, is, is in charge. <clears throat> but he, he gives to the lords below him. He, he gives them uh, uh, fiefs and peasants right here, okay? A fife is a land grant. Peasants are, of course, these people. So, so whatever land grant the lord gets from the king, whoever lives on that land now becomes his peasant. They, they will do his bidding, okay? So the king gives land to the lords below them. And in return, the lords offer the king their loyalty and military aid. So if you have a, there's going to be a war, I will fight for you because you gave me land, okay? 
So this is the this is the first tier, okay? But then below the lords are the knights, okay? So these are not not quite peasants. But they're 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 on their way up. They <clears throat> they've they've got upper mo mobility, okay? So the lords give the the knights below them food, protection, shelter, okay? So they they have you know the, what you need to live: food, protection, shelter. In return, the knights. Uh, give the lords their homage, their loyalty, their support, and military service if need be. Okay, <clears throat> and then pe uh, continuing on to the bottom of our pyramid, the the knights give to the peasants below them also food protection and shelter, but the peasants are only expected to do one thing, and that's work yourself, you know, to uh, all, every day, all day, farm the land, just do that, farm the land. But you've also got to pay rent. So it wasn't like you paid money, you would pay crops, okay? So you'd farm the land, you could keep a little for yourself to live, the rest would go to the, the knights, they would pass that wealth up to the lords, up to the king. So this is kind of the feudal system that, of course, oppressed the bottom tier. Uh, the peasants, for sure, in some cases, the knights had, had no chance to get out of this. But the peasants, for certain... They, they literally had no chance at all to ever get ahead and ever ever rise up to the next tier. They just were workers. And it doesn't say in our pyramid here that they gave the uh, the knights above the military service, but they certainly did. And they, the, the peasants, the serfs, would be the people in the front lines that, that die quickly, okay? Uh, you know, cannon fodder, uh, like an infantry. You know, you're in the front lines and you're going to go first, okay? that That was the kind of life that you had if you were a, a peasant or a serf, okay? Let's take a break here and watch this sh a short film to kind of put it into, into a better perspective for us. Please watch the film entitled Feudalism in Medieval, in Medieval Europe. Simple explanation. And then come back. Come on back when you're done with that, okay? Okay, so these so these agreements between these these. Uh, levels. Many times you would you would write out a pledge. Uh, most of the time you're talking about knights to lords would, would write out a pledge that you know we we will I will I will give you my my honor. I mean my homage, my honor, and also my support, but also military service. And some of these were very complicated. And I'm, I'm, we're going to look at one here and, and try to tell me what you think's going on here. Okay, this is one. This is a pledge of that time. I, John of Pole. Make it known that I am the faithful man of the Lady Beatrice, Countess of Troyes, and of my most dear Lord Theobald, Count of Champagne, her son, against all persons living or dead, except for my allegiance to Lord Angerland of Cousy, Lord John of Arsis, and the Count of Grand Pre. Wow, that's a whole lot going on there. If it should happen that the Count of Grand Pre should be at war with the Countess and Count of Champagne on his own quarrel, He's already said, I've got allegiance to both these people. If, if they come to a battle, I will aid the Count of Grand Pre in my own person and will send to the Count and Countess of Champagne the knights whose service I owe them for the fife which I hold of them. So he's essentially saying, I will fight for one side. I'll send my knights to fight for the other. Okay, this is how, this is complicated. And this is, this is the European system. It's a complicated system. It's all about the kings at the top. And depending on what kind of king you were, you know, uh, there were probably a few here and there that were kindly, but most weren't. Most were selfish and greedy, lived lives of debauchery and just wanted, you know, uh, for themselves. OK, so this is the, this is the system that people want to get away from. We don't want to be part of this. We want to get away from this oppressive life, leave Europe severe restrictions, unjust treatment, own your own land outright. In the Americas, let's go there. It was a big start that could result in future wealth. But understand, this this is only available to white people. Of course, you're talking about Europeans. It's mostly white people, African Amer African people, uh, 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 Native American people. They, they had no chance to to come to America or, and, and get land. This was only available to European people. Okay, and they came by indentured servant, whatever, however they could get here. And so the population grew so quickly. That land became scarce. It's, again, it's hard to imagine early 1700s that land was scarce in the United States. I'm sorry, not the what would become the United States, but it was okay. Um, so um, 
you know, the your 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 opportunities diminish because the land's scarce. So uh, this is the problem, and people people are looking for ways to, to to break out of this. Okay, so the population in British North America in 1720 was 400,000. Uh, so, so that's a hundred years from uh, uh, after Jamestown. So it's grown to almost a half million people in in a hundred years. By 1765, it was two million people. So five times growth in 45 years. That's that's a, a tremendous amount of people. Okay. So this changes the way people were. These self-sufficient farms, you you couldn't really be that anymore because the land was your land was too small. So it changed to what's called a household mode of production. And the, this idea of exchanging goods with others to survive on lands, okay, that was that were becoming smaller because land's becoming scarce. And, and this is, so it's not a good thing. You're getting less land and you have to rely on others to, to help you. So, for example, you might be a carpenter uh, and your neighbor is a blacksmith and you, you, you both need each other. So you help each other. You work with each other. So it's it's a negative thing on the one hand because land's getting scarce and you can't be self-sufficient. But on the other hand, this is where you have this kind of very American idea of helping your neighbor. You know, help your neighbor clear a, clear a forest to, to plant his crop, help your neighbor build a barn, whatever it might be. All the men in the area would come together to help the neighbors. This all comes out of need and necessity that, that you can't do it all yourself anymore, okay? So the people come, and they keep coming and coming and coming. In 18th century immigration, 19th century, of course, we still argue about immigration today to, in, in, our, in our new millennium, right? Uh, and, these, and these people are all different now, different languages, religions. Of course, what happens to the land when the people come? They want that land. Well, what, so what does that mean for Native Americans? They're pushed out even further. The colonists continue to spread out. The, the Natives continue to perish from disease. And they can't stop it. They just keep on getting pushed back further and further while their population contracts. Okay, So understand, all this growth, all this opportunity, all this very come to the Americas to start your dream, it's at the expense of Native American lands and the Native American ways. Uh, okay, so I mentioned before how you know, in, the, in the New World, the colonies, the British colonies, uh, any chance you, you have to become more like Europe again, people fight. We don't want to be like them. We, we don't want anything to do with them. But people try anyway. And there was a, an attempt on the Hudson River north of New York City where you have these huge estates and manors, much like the feudal system with their manors, uh, where you have the patron is the is the man in charge of that of this vast piece of land that, that all these people work for him. Okay. And this was this was put into place by very wealthy English and Dutch families in an attempt to recreate the feudal manor system or, and this European gentry. But but again, it didn't last for long. I and mean, people have resisted going back to the European ways. We, we are not going to do that. OK, this is an interesting. If you're ever in uh, New York City and north of the city, some of these estates and manors are still there. They're pretty interesting. Uh the shortage of land creates lots of problems, and, and some people don't have any at all. So you squat on land. You find a piece of land that no one's on, and you squat there. You make a homestead. It's not your land, but you need a place to stay. This creates problems, but in some cases, these people actually end up owning the land. Okay. Uh, another type of indentured servant would be called a redemptioner. So a redemptioner was a person that was already in America looking for an opportunity. So, of course, they could negotiate their contract a little better because they didn't have to be brought here. The the worker, the, the person that needed a worker didn't have to pay the passage over. They were already here. So they were able to negotiate better terms, okay? Okay, so a, another event that's happening in the world that, that, that has a huge impact on the growth of <clears> – <throat> the American colonies and later the United States is the Enlightenment. We've talked about this before a little bit. So the Enlightenment, this is coming out of that long, dark Middle Ages, the Dark Ages after the fall of Rome, 5th century BC, uh, I'm sorry, CE, okay? Uh, of course, that, that, that era 
is viewed as a troubled period marked by that loss of classical learning, an era of ignorance, superstition, social chaos, repression, people believed in folk wisdom, magical powers. The Catholic Church was, was oppressive and held people down. Uh, then you have this awakening and you have what's called the Renaissance first and kind of this return to art and, and people start to start to turn back towards you know learning and knowledge and this scientific revolution in the 16th century challenges the old ways and this is the enlightenment so 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 you, you suddenly have scientific explanations about the universe mathematics you know the the laws of the world and you start to to see that you know things things happen for a reason <clears throat> not always just because god thinks so okay uh, this changed the way people felt about the world and themselves. Uh, so let's take another break here and watch our next film. This is a short film that looks at this new ideology, the Enlightenment, and looks at some of its thinkers and philosophers. So go ahead and watch the film and come on back. Okay, so there's four principles of Enlightenment. Uh, Law-like order of the natural world. In other words, the natural world is going to exist and run itself it's not run by any supernatural being. It, it, just, it, it just runs itself. Uh, two, the power of human reason. The, the human, humans have agency and can think things through and come up with, with ways to move ahead in their, in their lives. You don't have to rely on a faith uh, to do it. You can rise above it yourself. Again, it's not anti-religion. It's just saying that you don't have to you know, be think that everything in your life has to do with 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 God making that decision for you. Okay. Uh, number three, the natural rights of individuals very important to the formation of the United States. This idea of life, liberty, freedom, uh, equality those are natural rights. So understand that's a that's a a, a definite change in the way it had been. Uh, in Europe, it was about the kings, and you didn't have these natural rights. You you were oppressed, and that's all there was to that. Okay, so this is this is a new idea, and and part of the Enlightenment that will that will inspire America. And lastly, the progressive improvement of of society. That society should should constantly evolve and get better and better. Okay, <clears throat> so we talked about John Locke last class, a uh, very important person in American history, history in general. <clears throat> He, he wrote two, uh, two essays. One is called An Essay Concerning Human Understanding. The other one's called Two Treatises of, of Government. And he challenges these old, old ideas. And he says, life and its future is not preordained. It's not preordained by God. That's incorrect. It can be changed. And you have agency to, to create your own path. You can change it by education by rational thought and purposeful action, you, you can you can you can chart your own path. He also says that that rule was uh, by a king is not a God given right, and we talked last class about replacing that with the consent of the governed, where people elect a, an official who speak for them. Okay, uh, but probably most famously, Locke believed that people had. Natural rights to life, liberty, and property. This is a big one. That this was this was shocking that common people could have these kind of rights it was unheard of in those days. These words would later inspire Thomas Jefferson when he wrote the Declaration of Independence, but he changed it to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So I'm assuming that Jefferson didn't really want to put down on paper that everybody had the right to property. He was a you know, a wealthy aristocrat that probably wanted most of the property for himself. So he changed it to the pursuit of happiness. Uh, so, so Locke is very instrumental in inspiring some of America's core values, okay? So we, we look back on these founding fathers, and, and pe many people believe that they came here to, to create a Christian nation. And that's, that, well, that's not completely untrue. It's not entirely true either. Some did. The pilgrims, the Puritans, they came here to escape religious persecution and be able to practice their religion without anybody hassling them. But most of the rest of the colonies besides those came for business. It, it, so it wasn't, a com wasn't completely a, a, 
a uh, an attempt to create a Christian nation. Okay, now most of the people that came here were Protestants, so that that is true. But the country, the colony itself, and the country itself wasn't designed to be a Christian nation per se. In fact, many of the founding fathers were deists. They believed in in deism. So what is that? The belief based solely on reason in a God who created the universe and then abandoned it, assuming no control over life, exerting no influence on natural phenomena, and giving no supernatural revelation. So perhaps the word abandon is a little bit too severe, but the idea that God, yes, we believe in a God, and God created, we believe in God, God created the universe and the earth, but then he left it to us to to run ourselves, okay? He assumed no control, he exerted no influence, and he gave no supernatural revelation. So not not uh, an, an atheist, but not the uh, tenets of Christianity at the same time either, okay? So many of the founding fathers were deists, and, and Thomas Jefferson, and Franklin, and and uh, Washington, you know, these people were not hugely devout Christians. They were deists, and this was popular in that era. So the Christian God created the world, but left it to run according to national laws. I'm sorry, natural laws. The law-like order of the natural world was one of the four uh, points of the Enlightenment, okay? Th this created a fur kind of a... a, a a protest as a reaction. So re religious leaders uh, reacted in protest to new ideas, especially Puritans. Okay, and they they respond to this enlightenment and this new scientific knowledge. They don't like that. Uh, and so there's a religious revival, a time of reawakened interest in religion. As a result of all this newfangled science and enlightenment, that these things that 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 weren't about you know about religion or about faith, okay. So you have a you you have a surge in popularity in religion, and Pietism is born, uh, reclaiming Pietism, retrieving an evangelical tradition. So Pietism or being pious, okay. So pious, pious behavior devoted to the observance of religion. You're reverent or devout, and it's done for the benefit of others or with the intention of encouraging good. Okay, so so the the Pietist uh, re, uh, movement includes revivals, revival movements. What what's a revival? A meeting or series of meetings for the purpose of reawakening religious faith. Okay, uh, try, you're you're trying to restore a validity of something that lapsed in their mind. We are the, the modern world is moving away from faith, and we've got to stop that. So this is a, a resurgence in, in religious observation, okay? So historians call this era the Great Awakening. It's actually the first Great Awakening. There'll be a second one in the 19th century also. So the first Great Awakening is a revitalization of religious piety that swept through the, English, the American colonies between the 1730s, 1770s. It's an it's an it's an evangelical upsurge taking place in England, Scotland, Germany, and it comes over here to the Americas. Okay, and this new age of faith rose to counter the currents of the age of the Enlightenment, to reaffirm the view that that being truly religious meant trusting your heart rather than your your head, or relying on feeling more than thinking relying on biblical revelations rather than human reason or science, okay? And these revivals become become hugely popular. Here you, here you see a man with a crowd around him outside. Most of these were done outside because so many people came. Thousands came. There wasn't a hall or a home or a building big enough to, to uh, you know, house the people that came. And you have these hugely popular uh, uh, speakers, George Whitefield especially, and, and known for his emotionally charged sermons, evoking vivid and terrifying images about the utter corruption of human nature and the terrors awaiting the unrepentant in hell. And he drew audiences so large, again, here you see him, he's got to be outdoors. But George Whitefield, uh, he, he led a movement to reform the Church of England. So 
similar to the Puritans and, and their earlier attempts to purify the church, he's trying to reform it also. Uh, as a result of his, of his efforts, the Methodist church was founded late in the 18th century. So he preached everywhere in the American colonies. According to Whitefield, sinful men and women were dependent for salvation on the mercy of a pure, all-powerful God. So he would gesture dramatically, weep openly, thundering out threats of hellfire and brimstone. He turned his sermons into a gripping theatrical performance, and this became very, very popular. But it somewhat split the the religious world. Okay, where you have the you have what's what are called the old lights and the new lights. Okay, so the old lights were conservative ministers opposed to the passion displayed by the these new evangelical preachers. They preferred to emphasize the importance of cultivating a virtuous Christian life. So old light would would have a rational appeal, not emotional. <clears throat> An educated ministry, you, you had to be educated to be minister, and it mostly catered to the established classes, the, the privileged classes, okay? The new lights were evangelical preachers, that preached about a Christian faith that was intellectual and emphasized spiritual rebirth. Okay, uh, they have emotional appeal. You, a, a converted ministry, in other words, you could you could become one without having to go through a years of training. <clears throat> and they mostly appealed to the dispossessed classes, the the, the lower working classes. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so this is kind of the the the, uh, the the setup of these colonies and what they've been through. But we I've said before, you everything's pointing towards this these war war with the French and these French and Indian wars. And you have this 75 year period where you have four of these wars. Um, of course, you're you're it's it's about control. And we talked again. The, the England had England had less land but more people hemmed in by those mountains on the coast like sardines. The French had a lot less people, but had all the land and strategic waterways. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> so the competition for control of the continent would last 75 years. And you have these four wars. Okay, so I'm going to tell you about the first three very quickly. And I'm just going to tell you that I'm not going to ask you any, any exam questions about these. It's the fourth one that we need to be focused on but but just so you know how this how this kind of played out there were three before the the final fourth one okay uh, the first one is called King William's War 1689-1697 so eight years mostly it was front uh, frontier raids on New York and New England um, you know in the frontier of of, uh, of New York okay above Albany we've talked about that before uh, then you have a, a five-year break, and you have Queen Anne's War. So, again, same thing, bloody fighting across the entire frontier. European diplomats more concerned with the balance of power in Europe than the military situation here. So not a huge presence of the British military in the first two wars, okay? Uh, the third war is called um, – so I'm sorry. Let, let's look at this map again. So, uh, again, just to, just to review, remember Albany. This is a modern-day map, but Albany was the farthest north settlement for, and New York City down here. So, And, of course, the Iroquois over here. So this, this, this entire area here is where all these frontier raids took place. And, and these, were, these were awful, awful situations. The, the natives would come down from the north. And raid the English settlements, and and kill people, and and you know scalp them, massacre them, uh, commit atrocities to them. They would then kidnap and take captives back with them. Okay, but understand, it wasn't just the natives doing this. The French, the white Frenchmen, came along with them and did it also. Okay, and and it, it happened both ways. The English also also raided north. Very famous raid by uh, Robert Rogers and his rangers go north into Canada and attack and massacre the people of the Abenaki settlement. So, so frontier raids is what this, what these first three wars are about, all taking place here. Not to suggest that nothing happened anywhere else. It did on the coast and trying both both sides. The, the French are trying to capture Boston. 
the Eng English trying to capture Quebec. There's some cities on the on the coast that were taking Louisbourg and so on. But for the most part, it was about this. It's about land and 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 whose land is it in all these conflicts? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> okay. The third war is called King George's War. So you've got a long period of peace. You've got 31 years uh, between the last war to this one. <clears throat> but the truth is, these are these are declared wars. The truth is, the raids and the skirmishes didn't stop for 75 years. There, there might be a war going on, there might not. They still fought each other, okay? So um, even though there's a long period of time there, you still have these endless raids and skirmishes, okay? Okay, so so King George's War, also characterized by, by bloody border raids by both sides with the aid of their French with their aid of their, of their Indian allies, okay? So that's the first three to set the stage. You don't have to know, you know, uh, recall that or you won't have any questions about that. But the fourth one you will, okay? It was the fourth French Indian War, 1754-1763. So this is the years it, it takes place in, in the colonies. This would be, called, would be called the Seven Years War worldwide it becomes a world war where it's fought for seven years but it, it, it rages here for a few years before that happens okay so this is the one that's important for our purposes and this is the one that that will end in the final defeat of France and and would leave Britain as the last one standing <clears throat> and the European country that had finally gained control <clears throat> of North America from the Atlantic to the Mississippi River okay okay um, so what I want to do right here is do a supplemental lecture, and we'll call this Young George Washington, okay? So um, like I always do, I'm going to give you a sketch outline of the, uh, I'm sorry, a sketch outline of the of the uh, lecture itself to kind of, so you know where I'm heading, okay? So what I'm, what I'm going with this is George Washington, even though we know about him later with the revolution, the presidency, and so on. This is where he first comes on the stage of history, and in in fact, a a bad decision by him sparks the fourth French and Indian War. So he actually is the reason why this fourth fourth war starts. Okay, okay, back to our sketch outline. So number one, background development. Always, you always want to give me an intro with some background and development of the lecture. Okay. So I mentioned before, and we're going to talk talk about it in more detail here. The English release. 200,000 acres in the Ohio Valley. <clears throat> this this causes the French to build forts along the frontier, okay? <clears throat> Number two, George Washington, letter A. He, be he becomes an emissary for, Di for Governor Dinwiddie. Uh, Number two, surveys the fort. Number three, attacks the French. And number four, the commander was killed, okay? Number three is Braddock. I should say the French commander was killed in that last one. Um, number three is Braddock. Uh, marching marching a, a, on the French in parade fashion, he would be ambushed and killed. Washington takes command. Uh, number four is the relevance. The relevance of this lecture is this is where Washington enters American history, and he will be an impactful figure for the next 50 years, all the way up to the start of the 19th century. But this foolish incident attacking the French when he was 20-something years old sparked the Fourth French and Indian War, okay? Okay, so you have the ability to go back and, and, and hear that over again if you didn't get that entire outline. So please do that if you need to. But I'm going to go ahead here with the lecture, okay? So George Washington, 21 years old. This is where he enters American history and the birth of this American legend starts, okay? Uh, this is where he's first seen in history. Okay, so going back to this idea of, of, the, of the English releasing 200,000 acres of land in what was called the Ohio country. So that, 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 of course, is where this state of Ohio is today. But the French are saying, well, well, now, wait a minute. This is our land. Why are you releasing, you know, saying that this is your land and saying, encouraging your English settlers to come. And this is French land, okay? You're on the west side of the Appalachians here. So the French take notice, become worried. They're encroaching on our land. So they begin to build forts along the frontier in strategic places, typically around waterways. 
Frontenac, Oswego, Venango, La Beef, Fort Duquesne, uh, Fort, uh, and so on. Okay, these are all English forts built. I'm sorry, French forts built to to stop the English from coming because they assume that they will. So they build them to do two things: defend themselves and stop English settlement. Okay. <clears throat> So Governor Robert Dinwiddie, okay, of Virginia, he's the governor of Virginia, he determines that this land in the Ohio Valley is English land by right. So we're gonna I'm gonna send an emissary or you know a a person that's not not threatening, not by war, you're you're under no threat, but a person to go out and speak for the for the English, okay? I, I'm gonna send an emissary out to the French forts to ask them to leave. OK, <clears throat> uh, so he decides to send George Washington. Uh, of course, George is 21. He's very excited to have this, you know, this this uh, adventure and this honor to do this. I'm going to be the governor's emissary. I'm going to travel across the frontier. I'm going to go to these forts and ask them politely to leave. This is our land. OK, so he takes off with with himself and one one uh, uh, scout. That, that you know knows the territory a little bit better. He they take off over an Indian trail. It's, it's hardly known by white men, uh, and this journey takes him you know a thousand miles round trip by horseback, by foot, by canoe, raft. Uh, Ten weeks he's gone. Uh, it was a it was a complete adventure. He survived an Indian attack. Uh, he almost drowned in a river. Uh, almost froze, death got lost a few times, but he successfully go, he comes out to the Ohio Valley and he goes to a couple of forts. And of course, in, in the European fashion, they bow to him, come on in, sit down, have dinner, have some wine. How are you? How's your family? We're honored to have you. They're enemies. They're, they're, they're adversaries. But this this is this is the European way. It's about honor. You're you're an officer, so I'm going to honor you. Okay, but we're not going to leave. <laughs> nice try, bro. But we're not going to leave. Okay. Um, but thanks for coming. We appreciate it. So Washington comes back. Well, okay, I tried, but they're 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 not going to leave. Okay. So he he writes uh, a report for for Dinwiddie about his 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 expedition and what happened. And this becomes known as the Journal of Major George Washington, sent by the Honorable Robert Dinwiddie Esquire, His Majesty's Lieutenant Governor and Commander-in-Chief of Virginia to the Commandant of the French Forces on Ohio. Wow, long title. But this is what he did. He sent out there to talk to the people at the forts to ask them to leave. So this, he writes this journal for, for Dinwiddie, but they publish it. It becomes very popular and the general public can buy this. This in fact is a book you can you can buy on you know uh, Amazon. I mean it's very readily available. There's websites that where the whole thing's you know uh, an ebook you can uh, you can get you can check this book out of the out of the college uh, bookstore. Uh, so not a you know it, this this is a book that's still very popular. So he becomes like a adventure hero. Because he had this adventure, and people love him, and he's a different kind of guy. In an era where, where men were mostly a little bit smaller, shorter than they are today, uh, he was six foot four, six foot three, yeah, very tall, uh, you know, kind of commanding presence, uh, 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 probably the best horseman in the colonies. He came from a wealthy family, privileged. He would later marry the most, uh, the, the richest woman in the colonies, and become the wealthiest man in the colonies. So, but he comes back with, they're not going to leave. So, so Dinwiddie says, okay, you know, I'm going to send you back. Okay, uh, this is in 1754, about a year later, uh, not quite a year. I'm going to send you back because out there, there is a a geographical location where two rivers come together to form another one. And this, of course, is where the city of Pittsburgh is today, Three Rivers. Two rivers come together, the Yakageni, the Monongahela Rivers come together, and they intersect and become one river. That is the headwaters of the Ohio River, of course, a very important river in history, okay? Whoever controls that, that, that Three River area will control the frontier because everyone's coming and going by rivers, right? So go out, go back out there. And I'm going to send you a platoon this time. So you might, you, maybe that's 30, 40 men. 
I want you to go out there. Washington was a surveyor. Uh, go out there and survey the land and come back and tell me the feasibility of building a fort there. Okay, so go out to the forks of the Ohio, these, these, three, these three rivers that come together, and it was called the forks of the Ohio, and, and you know, assess it and come back and tell me, you know, the, what, what we should do if, if it's feasible to, to build this fort, okay? So he does, and he goes, and here, here's, the, here's the rivers I'm talking about. So in, back in the day, on the left, there's nobody there. You see these two rivers come together, and, and where these two rivers come together right here, this is where the Aha River starts, okay? And this, this is where Pittsburgh is today. Of course, this is a modern-day picture of Pittsburgh, okay? These same, these same two rivers. So Washington goes there, but he sees that they're already, there's already a fort being built there right here. The French have beat you to it. The French are building Fort Duquesne. Okay, and we talked about Fort Duquesne as the as the uh, destination for Mary Jemison when she was kidnapped. And this is where she was there, where she was adopted out to to the tribes with French, you know, approval. Okay, the white Frenchman approval. Uh, so of course he he realizes well we, there's not much we can do here. So um, let's just go back, and he left unnoticed. And so the so the French didn't see him and his men. Up on the up on the hill that would be Mount Washington today. <clears throat> so he's coming coming back to Virginia. On his way back, he finds a group of French soldiers encamped, maybe a platoon the same size as his. Uh, they don't see him, uh, Washington and his men, and there's no pickets up or guards or you know scouts to see what's going on. They they assume we're in the middle of nowhere. There's nobody going to hurt us out here, so they're not really paying attention. So Washington sees this opportunity and he attacks them now this is the foolish moment i'm talking about okay these two countries were not at war at that time they've been skirmishing but not a declared war um they weren't doing anything wrong they weren't threatening but washington saw his chance for glory so he attacked and of course they surprised them and and defeated them pretty easily okay so so while they were negotiating a surrender, Washington and the commander of the French forces, again, they revert back to that honor, okay? I'm so happy to meet you, sir. You are, you're a worthy adversary. On any other, uh, other land or day, you, you could have easily defeated me. I'm happy to have your acquaintance. Please sit down, have some. This is how they were. The natives don't like this because the natives don't, don't, don't do it that way. So while this is going on, a man named Tenogerson, okay, now Tenogerson is called the half king. That That's a real term, okay, you, you are not quite a full king, you're a half king. Uh, but he he was sent with Washington as a scout and a guide on this journey, okay. So while Washington is talking to Ensign Jumonville right here is the man that Washington's negotiating surrender with, uh, he says, thou art not dead yet, my father. Then he raised his tomahawk and killed him. He just, out of the blue, just took his tomahawk out and and hit Jumonville in the head and killed him right in front of Washington. Washington's, of course, in complete shock. He's still very young, not sure what to do. Chaos ensues. Everyone's running around screaming. And one of the French soldiers escapes when no one's looking and goes back to Fort Duquesne. To, to alert them, hey, this 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 English platoon attacked us for no reason, and Ensign Jumonville's dead. Okay, he was the he was the highest ranking officer of the of the of the French forces camped in the in the uh, in the woods. Okay, so it turns out that the commander of Fort Duquesne was Ensign Jumonville's brother. So he's pretty angry. <clears throat> Washington's killed his brother. <clears throat> For no reason, not provoked. So Jumonville gets a an army together and they they come after Washington, okay? And Washington understands that he's being pursued, so he takes off, but he realizes that there's no chance that we're going to escape. <clears throat> they're they're coming too quickly and we can't move that fast. <clears throat> So Washington builds very famously, this is a famous moment in American history, builds this, this fort out of just debris he finds in the woods, in the, in the country. 
<clears throat> and he puts up a, a like a defense works and he calls it Fort Necessity. This is a fort built out of necessity. And this is a this is a state park in Pennsylvania today. You can visit it and see. This is a recreation, not the the real one, but a recreation of what what was there. Okay. Of course, the French, you know, defeat them pretty easily, soundly, and Washington's defeated. <clears throat> of course, she's embarrassed. Oh my gosh, what have I done here? So again, they come up with surrender terms. And they draw them up, but now they're written in French, and they're and they're pushing it to Washington. Sign these surrender terms, and we'll let you go. You can go back to Virginia and go home. But he can't read French. French, okay? So they're like, well, we don't care. It's pouring rain. The ink is running. But you just sign it. And and Washington, you know, impetuously, and perhaps. Uh, you know, because of his youth and a little bit not sure what to do, he go, oh, okay, fine, I'll sign it, okay? Well, it turns out that he actually, the, by signing that document, that document was him saying that, yes, I assassinated Ensign Jim Winville myself. I did it on purpose, okay? So so Washington is, is allowed to, to, to go back to, to Virginia, but in the meantime, Virginia finds out about this. The French find out about it. And the fourth war is is sparked. By the time Washington gets back to Washington, this war is on. <clears throat> he of course is embarrassed <clears throat> and can't believe. Like, well, I, I didn't do that. He claims his innocence, and and probably most people believed him. But you signed this thing. You shouldn't have done that without knowing what you were signing. So the damage was done. This is the incident that would spark the fourth French and Indian War that would morph into what's called the Seven Years' War, a worldwide war. Uh, between England and France. I'm going to only talk to you about the Seven Years' War as part of this. I'm not going to ask you any questions about anything to do with that. Just understand the Fourth French and Indian War is the one that is important for us in this class, and that 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 this was a small part of a larger world war called the Seven Years' War, where England and France are fighting each other around the world. Okay, <clears throat> so the war's on, and and England's angry. French are angry. What are we going to do? So that, so England decides, that let's just put an end to this right now. And let's bring our, our biggest, baddest general that we have, <clears throat> General Edward Braddock. He is experienced. He's brutal. He's harsh with a huge force. And march on Duquesne and wipe them out once and for all. And that will probably end it and this war will be over. Okay. So he comes here. Very, very arrogant man. Egotistical. He comes to the colonies where, of course, he looks down on them. You, 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 lowly colonists. You know, I'm, I'm a, I'm a regal British commander. Okay, uh, we're gonna march out there and wipe them out. So he, he actually asks Washington to be his second command. Of course, Washington's thrilled because, of course, he, he embarrassed himself, and and he, after being a very popular man after writing his journal, now he's kind of fallen from grace. But now he gets his chance to, to redeem himself. Uh, Braddock wants him to be second in command because you've been out there twice. You you know the land, okay? So now this this little trail that Washington and his guide originally went on, then he went across with the platoon. It got a little bit bigger. <clears throat> now you got a full army with wagons and all kinds of things. So they they widen this road as this trail as they go out towards Fort Duquesne. You start in Maryland and you go all the way to Pennsylvania, uh, present day Pittsburgh, okay? So just just to sidebar a little bit, this road continues to be used over the years. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Today it's part of the interstate system. So Washington's little Indian trail that he walked across 300 years ago today is a is a you know eight ten lane highway. Okay, just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So so Braddock's pretty pretty confident. <clears throat> We're gonna. <clears throat> we're going to march out there. We're going to go in parade fashion. What does that mean? It means you're going to march in, in, in you know, parade fashion. You're going to have your fifes and drums blazing away. <clears throat> so fifes are small flutes. The point is they're going to hear you coming with drums and so on. This is the European way. You didn't sneak up on people. You, you It was about, you know, man-to-man -man honor. If you're going to fight somebody, you come out. You let them know you're coming. You find a field that's suitable, and you fight each other. Uh, this is the European way of battle, okay? 
So because he's so arrogant, he, he just didn't think the French could even stand up to his invincible British army. So he didn't reconnoiter or inspect, observe, or survey the enemy. He didn't send scouts out ahead to see what, what they're getting into. You always do that with an army in those days before air to see what's out there. But you don't want to turn a corner and be ambushed. Okay, so, But he didn't do that because he thought, we don't need to. They're scared. They're, they're probably cowering but in the walls of Fort Duquesne, and we're going to crush them, okay? Uh, <clears throat> so he does this. Uh, now, the French, of course, are back in, in Fort Duquesne, small force. They, we are going to get crushed. If we don't do something here, if we just sit here, they're going to crush us, and they're coming. So what do we do? Well, we talked before about how the French got along with the natives better, treated them with respect. So the natives taught the French their style of fighting. You have two different styles of warfare here. The European way what, and what Braddock is doing is you 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 march you know, triumphantly and proudly with your with your you know buckles gleaming and and your bright red coats you know, intimidating. You've got your bayonets. You're intimidating. You you march into a field and your opponent marches up to you. You face off each other from maybe 100 yards or, or 50 yards away, and the first line fires at each other. Many people die. The next line comes in. They fire. Many people die. They're not trying to hide behind rocks and trees. This is not honorable. You fight man to man. Okay. So this is what Braddock's doing as he's marching out there. I'm not going to hide. I'm coming. I want them to know I'm coming. I want them to be scared. Okay. But the native way of fighting was like, as you see in the right, hide behind trees, reconnoiter, have scouts out, uh, you know, all, all these types of things. Hide, you know, hide, hide behind, uh, behind any kind of object to help you not get shot. Uh, spying was 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 seen as dishonorable by the Europeans, but spying and was a big part of, of the native warfare. So a different type of warfare, and the natives talked the French into. Let's go out there and ambush Braddock as he's coming, okay? So they find this suitable part of the trail that's kind of long, and they, they, they get on both sides of, of the trail but hide in the, in the trees. And when Braddock's army comes through all the way in and is completely exposed, they attack him from both sides and very quickly wipe them out, okay? They ambush them and wipe out a much larger force and Braddock is actually killed in action. Uh, Washington is forced to assume command. And, of course, they're in complete retreat. He quickly buries Braddock in the middle of the road with no marker. So the wagons will, will, will run over it. And so no one knows he's there because they didn't want the natives to dig, dig it up and mutilate the body as they, as they might do. Okay, that was their custom. So this is an example of, of how a smaller force can defeat a larger force if you fight the native way, okay? Uh, there's no chance that the English would have lost in a face-to-face -face European-style battle with the French. They far outnumbered them. But in this case, the French used their brains. Let's ambush them, and it worked It worked to, you know, perfectly, okay? Uh, so Washington retreats back to Virginia again. Uh, and the French and Indian Wars in full, um, course, you know, uh, display. It's 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 on. This war is on. Okay. Okay. So the relevance of the lecture. One more time. Washington enters American history and will be an impactful figure for the next 50 years, all the way to the start of the 19th century. But this foolish incident, attacking the French for no reason, sparked this fourth French and Indian War. Okay. Okay, so with that, let's uh, stop here. This for uh, chapter four, part one, and go on. Go ahead and go to chapter four, part two. Thank you.